Thank you, uh, Art Gallery of New South Wales. And um, yep, I'm not good at winning crowds over. I'd like to say you already have to like me. And then, uh, so that's how it works. Cool, thank you. I've really, I've done things where like, people have just turned up. There's no, there was no reason why the people wouldn't have turned up except because they like me. And I still managed to lose them, like in the, in the discussion somehow. But um, yeah, so I guess I've been invited here because I, I've sat through the Archibald, uh, and I did my research, it's Archibald singular, not plural. I've sat for it uh, three times, and I think maybe four times, but I can't quite remember, I can't quite remember the fourth one. But um, the last time was for 2009 for this girl called Yvette Coppersmith, and it was, I met her at this Kabbalah evening, and so it was like this kind of guilt because she was part of the same community as me, so I sat for it. And, we, and she was kind of, I thought she was good, like, like I sat through because I thought she'd actually done like proper paintings like for like magistrates in the courts and so I thought if someone's got to do that they must be good. Anyway, so she painted me and she did like these like sketches of like different things. I sat for hours or whatever and the, the, the only thing that annoys me, which is like just everything about the picture, is that <laughs> I, I, I seriously only had one thing that I said. I said, this is the condition, right? It's like, I can't look fat in this painting. <laughs> and I actually went to the gym, like, for a couple of months, where she kept on going, oh, when can you come and sit for it? And I go, oh, listen, I just want to... Oh, because she had this thing where... Because, you know, like, artists are always like, oh, you know, I want to tell the truth. I, I want to see you look vulnerable or whatever. So she wanted me to do this top-off thing with my top-off. And I really... I was so against it in general, but I thought, oh, this is the girl who gets commissioned to do the paintings for, like, the courts and stuff. So she, like... She must know a thing. And I just thought it was like hypocritical because I'm always like, you know, in my shows, expecting people to kind of just, you know, get fatwas put on them and, you know, and not worry about me making out with their mothers and stuff like that. Oh, that's, oh, that's the other thing. She actually was, I forget what order it came in, but this girl, Yvette Coppersmith, I think it actually, no, no, she did the painting first. That's why I didn't feel bad. She's one of the girls, if you saw my series Race Relations, and I sort of surreptitiously give the impression that I'm stealing these Jewish girls and Eurasian girls underpants. She's one of the girls, Yve Yvette Coppersmith. And so when people are having a go at me for like stealing Yvette Coppersmith's underpants on national television, they don't know that like she previously backstabbed me by painting me fat in the, <laughs> in the Archibald. And the thing that's like annoying about like, so it seriously was, it was the only thing I said. I said, don't, and she took all these sketches of me, so I didn't know which sketch she was then going to develop into the big picture. And so there was somewhere I was sitting in a chair, and I'm like, sitting like, there was like, there was no way not to have folds on your stomach in, in the position that she seated me. Like, if Kate Moss was there, she would have had folds in her stomach. And that's the one she decided to, like, enlarge into the thing to show I'm vulnerable with folds in my stomach or something. And, um... Yeah, so then when, then when I went over to her house to see it, I was like, I really was, I didn't compliment it. Like, I didn't say anything bad, I just did that silent thing, you know, when I just said, oh, okay, 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 and that was it. And then it was, you know, and she knew something was up, but we've kind of made up since then, and yeah, blah, 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 so that's okay. The, uh, every other time I've been painted for the Archibalds, the person has sort of made it apparent that, like, like, there's a, the, like, they're all bitter about each other. Like, you, you know, that, and some of the flat get, get, gets kind of flushed out into the public, like, yeah, they, that's more a drawing than a painting and all that kind of stuff like that. But they're all, like, like, they're all just really bitter, like the other people, like, where it's like, well, why did that get chosen and not mine? And, 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 and also, the, the other thing, everyone else who's painted me has made it quite apparent that, that both, they're really just painting me because, like, you know, I've got a name, and secondly, they probably asked someone before me, and I was <laughs> like, they, you know, they contacted Roy and HG, and then sort of like I was next down, and they're there, but they are really, and when I sit there, because I kind of like hearing about the bitterness in all the different little industries and stuff like that, because all industries just have this sort of like real cattiness, and yeah, it's absolutely there in the, when you're being um, painted for an Archibald. Now, um, I'm going to ask you to ask me some questions. I can just keep on talking if you want, but yeah, ask me some questions about my work or anything like that. I've got, I've got some questions here, but like, don't you want to? <laughs> the um, I can tell you something new. Oh, by the way, do you know you're not going to be seeing something because because um, my idea here was going to be showing this thing that had 
hadn't been sc screened because for all these legal reasons or whatever, right? And I was going to, like, how cool would that have been? It's got the best backstory, right? But then at the last minute, um, the art gallery said, oh, we're going to be filming this for YouTube. So I was like, oh, well, I can't do it then. So because they got greedy, you're, you're not going to see this thing. So, yeah, so just by, if you're feeling like any hostility, like, directed towards them. But um, I can tell you, I've got a, a series coming up. And I'm telling you, my motivation for telling you this is telling you something new. I'm not like here, like, oh, I really want to plug this or whatever. So don't turn this against me. Anyway, there's this, I've got a half hour documentary that's going to be coming up next month, just before the census. And it's going to be broadcast on ABC One. And it's because um, the census is happening uh, in August. So just in the last week of July. And I go around and I explore... Um, I look into the what is your religion question on the census and you know how there's all people write down all these like crazy things like they're Jedi's or they're Matrixists or they're Harry Potterists or whatever so I'm like over in America and I've got I've tracked down people who sincerely and unsarcastically merge popular culture with old school religion so I've got this Muslim guy and he's like a scholar, and he um, became a Sufi Muslim as an 18-year-old, but, but the thing that kind of led him on the path, because he wasn't born a Muslim, was when he was 10 years old, he watched Star Wars, and he was like, he saw all these, and he says, this was the first signpost on my path to Islam, because he saw it, and then when he started learning about, more about Islam, and he was comparing it with the stories in Star Wars, and, um, and he just thinks they're indelibly connected. And he, sees, and he sees Star Wars through the, um, the entire prism of Islam. Anyway, so he's like one of the guys. And um, I've also, and also met uh, these two girls who have joined uh, an evangelical Christian church where they get exercised, because I like exorcisms. And, but the reason they joined is because they felt they'd been too um, exposed to uh, obsessions through the Twilight books. And, and had to get sort of, you know, whatever, Robert Peterson beaten out of them or whatever. And a guy who thinks he's, the, he's Neo in the, in the Matrix, but he actually believes it. Like, it's not, like, poetically. <laughs> like, he just thinks that, you know, Neo, the Matrix is telling the story of how the universe actually is. And in the Matrix, there's Neo, who's played by Keanu Reeves in the film, and that's... Jesus Christ in Matrix, and he's Jesus Christ, and he goes around in a long trench coat and stuff. Anyway, so you should watch that. So that's that. There, there. I can tell you more about the characters or whatever, because that was meant to be sort of like the tie-in. It was like, you know, Archibald. You know, you paint characters, and you know, I film people and stuff. Anyway, so you, so ask me some questions. Is it true you have a basement full of the Raspberry Cordial tapes that aren't released? No, no, no. The um, yeah, no, he's referring to, yeah, I, 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 before I was on television, I, I won this, me and my band won this kind of Battle of the Band competition where they got like 500 CDs pressed up, which was the prize or whatever, and like we sold like 12 or something. Yeah. Well, they're really bootleg, and it's like, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. And then like when Shock Music, I think when they were like going out of, or well, they were clearing out their warehouse, like they made a phone call about telling them that they were, they were crushing them. So, oh, yeah, right. I don't know why they hurt. I, I don't even think they gave us the option of, of like, taking them off their hands. Oh, okay. It was just crushing them. I don't know no, why they decided to hurt my like feelings like that. It's like this whisper that's it's just yes. this, this basement full of, you know, renegade tapes that aren't released. But anyway, that's yes. just a curious question. And question two. I'll take that as a comment. Okay. Question <laughs> two. <laughs> and um, I guess question two is how much truth was there behind the exorcism in um, uh, uh, First God? Well, he, like, uh, he, so he either hypnotised me or exercised me, so I don't, I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah, I was sort of out of it. such a, you know, note. I'm sure you've been asked that before. So yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, I don't, in, he's, he's in my new show. It's great. Um, Bob Larson, The Exorcist. I go back to him because he was a good character. <laughs> <laughs> no, it left us in a big cliffhanger. Sure. It was great. <laughs> all right, that's it. Are you able to tell us at all what the clip was about that you couldn't show? Well, you saw, I, I, can, I can only tell you kind of blandly and broadly, but basically legal action. And, and uh, yeah, I, I saw just in the broadest brush strokes, we uh, sort of uh, interviewed this white supremacist and in Mississippi and... 
after we thought we got away with it, but then after we left, and we sort of knew this before, but he was also he was an attorney as well as <laughs> a white supremacist. Yeah, so we were like high fiving ourselves as we got on the plane outside of Mississippi, but then once we arrived back in Australia, there was like a big pile of, you know, legal action and stuff like that, yes. So not good. But I will, part of the reason I can't tell you is because I'm going to be telling it in another form at some point. So, yeah, just ha hold on. <laughs> um, you've done a number of shows about religion and you've got a show with Father Bob. I'm yeah. interested in why you personally are interested in those sorts of questions. Why... Why for you is the study of religion interesting or what is it about it that appeals to you? Uh, well, I guess there's like, you know, like creatively and then sort of like in the real world. And so in, in both realms, it's sort of like it's sincere. So, you know, creatively, it's, it's just really good because it simply sets up these stakes that are good for comedy. Like every, there's, there's like this universal, oh, religion's serious and, you know, religion, you know, it's stuffy, you know, and it's conservative and stuff like that. So as soon as you sort of like, it's it's kind of shorthand for for that that world, and then like you come in as you know as Daffy Duck or the Marx Brothers or John Safran into that world, and just yeah, so it's it's just good as a sort of foil for for creativity. But then like sincerely, it's not my fault because they <laughs> like because I grew up and just had like real was thrown into like extreme environments, and my parents were like. Like, 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 my parents weren't bad parents, but they, like, it was definitely, like, confusing growing up because I grew up, like, Jewish, and I went to this ultra-religious Jewish school, but my parents weren't, and my mother was an atheist, who, and my grandparents didn't hate religion, and even though they were Jewish, and, but they loved the Yiddish language. So it was all, like, this mess and confusion, and, and it was sort of, like, it's all, it all got into me by osmosis. I wasn't really that interested, even, like, in religion, but I didn't hate it or whatever, but I just went to this ultra-Orthodox Jewish school for like five years for like all of high school. And I was just like, I was pretty cool with it. I just didn't think about it either way, really. I was just like into rap music. And, and so I just spent five years being obsessed with rap music. And then, but then once I left school, I realised somehow it all soaked into me and all the confusion. But the, the one thing that used to always mess with my head, because I, my parents also sent me to Sunday school at a young age, and I remember like being six and walking home from Sunday school and just being totally screwed up by the whole, because we learnt that on the first day God created, you know, the heaven and the earth or whatever, or light, God created light. And then I was just like, oh, yeah, but what happened before that day? And then I just could not, and I was going, oh, but maybe God had a mother and father. Yeah. Oh, but how did his mother and father get born? And it was just like, it just, and I was like six years old because of my stupid Sunday school class. So basically Richard Dawkins is right, it just like screws you up. And I can't, I can't unbrainwash myself. I like, I really want to. I know it's like all ridiculous, right? But I'm like brainwashed. No, I'm not like brainwashed specifically like with one, like Judaism or whatever. But like, for instance, I'm definitely, when I do something wrong, I think I'm going to get punished beyond all logic. Like if I was like an atheist, it'd be like, oh, I've done that bad thing, but I, I didn't get caught. And now it's two weeks later. So, you know what I mean? I should be fine. But I'm always like convinced like bad stuff and th there's no other reason for that besides I've been brainwashed into yeah religion or s mysticism or something and mysticism is I really like all the rituals and stuff and there's something really cool about those secret worlds which is kind of screwed up a bit now because of the internet because it's like basically you can type in you know Freemason and then bloop, or all that but you know because I'm so old when, when I was a kitty it was like it was actually like finding out stuff like you know, or what do the Scientologists think? Like, like you just had to like, it was like, oh my God, what's going on behind that Church of Scientology building? You know, like, and me and my friends, and we go, oh, let's go in and do the free personality test, and like, we'd go in there and go, go crazy, and like, I, <laughs> and we'd come out giggling. I was go, go, I wrote down that my name was Henry Rowland, <laughs> and stuff like that, and I wrote down your address, ah, and stuff like that. It was like so exciting, and it, and in Melbourne, there's all these like weird, like. Little, tiny bookshops that, like, when I was young, I used to, like, just used to freak me out because, again, there was, like, no internet. So there was this one, my, and my dad used to always um, mess with my head. Not mess with my because my dad was, like, interested in all this stuff. So he'd be, like, we'd be, like, at a bar mitzvah party and he'd go, oh, see that guy over there with the, see his tie? That's, you know, that's the Freemason symbol. I go, oh, Freemason? They go, yeah, it's a secret society. They don't like to be asked about it. Go ask him about it. And then, and then, 
And then I'd go up to him and I'd ask him about this Freemason. And I'd go, are you a Freemason? He'd go, yes, yes, or whatever. And then I was like, so my dad damaged me too. And my dad told me about this bookshop that was in Melbourne. I think it's still there. It's like up this narrow stairwell. And this was like before the internet, before Pauline Hanson and everything, where it was like, he goes, he goes, John, you know there's this like white supremacist bookshop up this stairwell in Burke Street, which is this, not, uh, that's, uh, in Russell Street, which is this main street in Melbourne. And I go, what, what, white supremacist bookshop, what? And then he, he goes, yeah, yeah, you go up this stairwell and you kind of, you go in there and there's like just a small room. And he was right, I don't know how he knew about it, except if my dad's a secret Jewish clansman or something like that. But I, <laughs> and then I sort of like, yeah, so I went up, I, it was like after school one day and I like waited outside, like heart beating. And then I like, finally snuck up and went into this room and it was, it was this little bookshop there with all these, like photogra- photocopied kind of racist stuff. It was like I'd never seen anything like before. And I, like I bought this Secret of the Freemason book and then left. And yeah, so I was just, I don't know, that's, that's, my, that's why I'm screwed up. I just wanted to ask, you know, when you went to visit the Zen monastery and you were speaking with the... He gave you a question, who am I or yeah. who are you? And yeah. how long did you have... For two, two questions. Yeah. How long did you have to think about that? Yeah. And also... Uh, how long did you actually spend at the monastery for the whole filming thing? Like, how long um, did it take? Probably two days or maybe one and a half days or whatever. But um, it seemed really long. But it was... The, the whole confusing thing with, like, filming stuff, especially if, like, like people have, like... They speak English, but it's slight slurry or whatever. Like, you're talking to them for an hour, and I was like... I didn't even quite understand everything that was going on. And then when you cut it together and you put those yellow SBS subtitles, like it all makes sense or whatever. But I was like, <laughs> most of the time I was there, I was just like not, I was like confused, like not really knowing what was going on. And like, but um, he didn't give me that much time to think. And, and it, it always sounds confusing when you're like filming it too, because it's like you can't disconnect it. And, and you know, you're on such a tight schedule or whatever. And I do, but what I do remember about the, that temple is I was sitting there meditating like and in this thing and that, they were filming me I was closing my eyes and I was trying to I was in my head I was going oh I'll give them different options so I'm like going mm, and then mm, mm. and I'm like trying to give that like, like more intense less intense because like sometimes things look stupid on camera I can't figure it out because I can't see myself I'm just kind of, like going on for about 15 minutes with these different and I open my eyes and like they left and they <laughs> and I was like furious because I'd actually been like partaking in the ritual without being filmed so it was like the Buddhist if a tree falls in the forest, if you film yourself doing a ritual but aren't being filmed, have you really been, you know, filmed? It was like that, yes. (laughs) But those monks were like, they like drank beer. It's really like, (laughs) it's really fun. When you hang out with like these little enclave, it's like slowly, even over two days, like you start to see, you know, behind the scenes a bit more and stuff like that and, and you start finding out things and, you know, you know like, like suddenly, like, by the second day, you, you, you sort of gather and you figure out, it's like, oh, like, so the kind of people who are in this monastery are, like, the rich kids who their parents can afford to send them to the monastery. And, like, so suddenly it's got this totally different spin on it than when you just see it. And then you see them, like, oh, they don't really, you know, they're meant to be Buddhist monks or whatever. But I've noticed they've got, like, cleaners that clean up everything. Like... Because that was the other thing about, I'm not dissing the monks, right? Except, because they did do this big song and dance about how, like, oh, look, when we clean the dish, we do it this way. They took me through it about, and it's all about, you know, making sure you take everything and leave as little work as possible. But, but whenever it was, like, cleaning up, they just clean up for as long as they felt like it. And then when they got bored, they just, like, you know, oh, whatever, and walk off. And then there was, like, staff that would, like, f- finish it off. So, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, with your experience in working with race and religion yes. and having lots of conversations with people with extreme views. Yes. Have you, do you think, been able to influence people's thinking? Is there a way of changing their views or is filmmaking or art a way of influencing people with extreme, especially with race in particular? Well, I have definitely, like, because, you know, when you, when you, we all Google ourselves, don't you? So anyway, so... <laughs> There's this website called Stormfront, and it's this white supremacist website, and I, I kind of just love it. And I type it because they, they, they sometimes talk about me, so it's my two favourite topics, me and sort of <laughs> Nazis and stuff. And I did see on that one time this guy say, like on a message board, he goes, oh, I'm really confused because I kind of 
do know what you sort of are saying about the Jews and the banks and stuff like that. Like, I get it, but, but I kind of really like John Safran. And so, <laughs> so he was like a white supremacist who was torn. And then, the, because of me, but like, does the Jewish community thank me? No, they just, they just, they just complain because I'm getting nailed to a crucifix and stuff. So the, um, and there was, there was, uh, but, you know, I don't think you can really change their minds that much. They're pretty stuck in their way. There was one of the guys who was at the, Ku when I went in to try to join the Ku Klux Klan and then told them, oh, because I, I did this whole thing, I was like, listen, I know, I didn't tell them I was Jewish, obviously, before I went, but then when I got there, I sort of brought up, like, just casually that I was Jewish and then acted all naive, like, because I was like, oh, listen, but I don't do anything Jewish anymore. You know, like, <laughs> I, I haven't been in a synagogue since my bar mitzvah. I, I, I eat pork, I drive on the Sabbath. Like, like, if I don't do anything Jewish, why can't I join the clan? And anyway, so one of the guys who was there, like I saw like years later, I hear him on a message board writing, going, oh, I was there when that happened or whatever, and, and I watched it. Oh, yeah, it was pretty funny, pretty funny. So, yeah, I think that's the most you can get out of, uh, yeah, you can convert them into thinking something's a bit funny. <laughs> So, John, is there any religious group that's on your target list that just hasn't had a bar of you? Like, is there someone, any group that you've been trying to get access to who just, you've had no luck? Uh, yeah, yeah, plenty, because, like, we kind of throw such a broad net at the very start. So we would have been knocked back by things. I'm trying to think what we would have been knocked back by. I know, and usually the worst bit, bit is if you get knocked back because... If you actually go in there, they sort of like begrudgingly respect you, like, because it's kind of like, oh, you, well, you turned up and you kind of, you know, like you didn't sneer from the sidelines. But I do remember in, in Versus God, we couldn't get access to the Church of Scientology, but I really wanted to do something on the Church of Scientology, so we did this skit. And so I would have happily have gone to the Church of Scientology, but they kind of not cut us off or whatever like that. So then we did this skit, and it, and it seemed a bit like a cheap shot. Like, it even seemed like a cheap shot to me, but it wasn't my fault. It was because it was like they wouldn't let us in. So, oh, they, but to be fair to them, they did let me in with my previous series where I kind of turned up dressed as Beck at the Church of Scientology because I'd heard that Beck was the Scientologist and blah, blah, blah. But um, I'm trying to think, yeah, we get like knocked back all the time, but it's, it's always a balance because sometimes usually things that are like these big things in your head when you're writing them on paper, sometimes they end up being the smaller things and then sometimes something that was smaller blows up into being a bigger thing. So it usually like evens out a bit, so yeah. Anyone what? Uh, yeah, probably. Like, for, for instance, when I did the Black Like Me episode of Race Relations, where I went undercover as a black person in Chicago, I think ideally in my head, it's like I would have hung... And I remember this, like, we're trying to get in with the Nation of Islam, which is like this black militant group. It probably would have made it a bit kind of better or stronger or that more valid or something like that. So, um, yeah, and I think we just... Uh, and, and, and often, because, like, there's so many stuff to do, it's like a researcher and a producer working it out, so I don't even understand. O often I don't even know how we got into somewhere or we didn't. But I had this weird relationship um, with one of these... one of the researchers, and he's really good at, like, somehow getting us into places, and I don't even ask him any questions because... Anyway, and so like, it's, it's like his role to just to get us into these places, and I don't even know how he does it. And then it's my role to just stay there, no matter how painful it is, until we get like something that we can use, or otherwise it's just too awkward turning back to Australia and we don't have, you know, we've spent all that time and money, you know, trying to do something or whatever. Given the different religions you have seen, but um, would there be any religion that you'd be, you'd like to be a part of? Um, yeah, I reckon there's, there's ones where I kind of go, oh, it's, it's like different religions have different flaws. Like, I, I don't think all religions have the same flaws for the same, at the same level. So, for example, maybe because of the way the Catholic Church is set up, that, that's more prone because of the structure, it's more prone to that awful sort of abuse. But then on the other hand, the Catholic Church is less prone to, like, you know, emptying your wallet of money because, you know, it's pretty easy to, you know, turn up to any Catholic church for free and, you know, and there's, there's a difference between it passing a collection plate out and, you know, the evangelical Christians or the Scientologists who just really 
try to empty your bank account. So yeah, so I, I sort of don't think they're all equal. And yeah, equally, like a Scientologist might be worse with money, but might be better with abuse or something. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so they're all different. And like the Jews are more tribalistic, but on the other hand, more op sort of open-minded in this other way. And so it's like it's all they've all got like different flaws. Like I don't, I don't think they've all got equal flaws. But and it depends what you mean. Like I like the mad ones. Like if I, so. But like the stakes are pretty low because I can just go there and then leave. Like I get way more criticism for not having a go at religion than for having a go at them. Like people are like, "Oh, it's easy for you to present the, or to say the Mormons are okay because I think they're okay." And but you you didn't grow up with them, and this is what happened to me. Oh, it's easy for you to say this, and because like like especially on like versus God, it's like most of the stuff wasn't like this malicious thing that sort of made the religions look bad. So I, I actually got more criticism for like basically not making them look bad. But well, why, what religion do you want to join? I'll tell you if it's good or not. <laughs> the one, I, like, for example, the Jehovah's Witnesses, I don't really dig. Like, I wouldn't want to be a Jehovah's Witness because I've got this whole thing where you, you shouldn't try to impact the world in any way. So, because therefore you're doing, God will take care of you. So, for example, you don't vote because that's making an impact when you should. And that just sounds like not really my cup of tea. And the Amish, they're like, don't even read the Bible that hard because you'll start thinking too much about the questions within it, you know what I mean? So it's like, I wouldn't go for those ones. I actually, I actually, I've done a few, I did some stuff with the Jehovah's Witness for Versus God, but never made it to air. And then we're like driving along and then the guy got lost, the Jehovah's Witness, and he like pulls out the street directory and stuff. And I was going, oh no, no, don't pull out the street directory, man. You know, God will take us there and stuff like that. And, but, he didn't, but yeah, it didn't didn't end up making it to air. <laughs> in the episode of Race Relations where you disguise yourself as a black man, yes, did yes, the yes. people that you befriended end up finding out that you were white? And was there any kind of fallout from that? Well, not, no, there was no fallout from it. Yeah, there, there, was, there was like, you know, I don't like always like revealing all the magician's tricks and stuff like that. But you know, the, no, some people did. And, and because the questions I, I was asking were so related to like when I was interviewing people, it was, it was like, so just say when I was at the speed dating and I'm talking to all these black girls, I'm going, oh, listen, why do you think, do you think people who are black would date better people who are black and who are white? And it, the, the questions were all those really focused. So when they kind of got, like, or smelt a rat, it, it, like they kind of got it, if that makes any sense. Like they'll go, oh, I get it. It's like this guy's, like, whatever. Yeah, so whenever we did get discovered, it just, for some reason, it just didn't have the heat that you'd think it would. I don't know. And I, I think you also, um, you have more permission as an outsider. Like, I always find it harder to do things in Australia. Like, everything's, like, way more heated. Like, where it's, like, uh, like, like if you were a German documentary crew or um, something like that, or from overseas, you'd probably find it easier to kind of get into, like, these indigenous communities and do stuff. But they're, like, really dark on, you know, white Australians and stuff. So, I, I, I can't explain it. But basically, I just did it and people knew it. Like, especially in the in the re fast food restaurant. People just knew, I can't even explain why, but I promise you I'm not lying. It just didn't seem that, it just seemed fine. And also the problem, like the thing we did with race relations, which was possibly a creative error, but I don't know, I, I, I stood by it at the time, was we definitely cut things to make everything look like the most awful thing ever. It was like, if there was like a moment that would have somehow given it some slight different, you know, Ah, oh, okay. I can I can breathe a sigh of relief, and because I know this now, like we yeah, cutting room floor. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, no. Basically, we didn't get in trouble. But yeah. Um, I know this is um, probably maybe a silly question to ask, considering your bad experiences before. But can I paint you for the Archibald? Oh well, you, well, you know, like yeah, if I, like you sent me something and or whatever. Well, I, this is what I do. This is what I'll really do because I did it to this other artist. I'll send it. You know that woman I was dissing before, you bet Coppersmith. <laughs> like so, someone else sent me something saying, "Oh, can you paint me?" And I sent it to her. I said, "Oh, this is this guy. Look at him. Should I let him paint me?" And she said, "No." So yeah. So basically, like if Yvette Coppersmith says, you know, you can paint me, I'll paint. You know what I mean? Because I, I don't know this stuff. But yeah, yeah. But yes, John Saffron at gmail.com. Thanks. <laughs> um, I was wondering, is there anyone you admire or look up to? Yeah, like what, what do you well, mean? Who? Because <laughs> you know, like how, how self-involved do you think I am? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, thought, I didn't mean that. Oh, sorry. They don't uh, exist, but who? 
Because you oh, never yeah, mentioned it. I guess, maybe we haven't no, caught it. No, I like kind of like... I guess at the moment I'm going through a bit of a reading thing at the moment, so I'm liking all these strange... Not strange. I like, I like writers that are sort of turn things on their head and make you kind of... Or pull the rug from under you and stuff like that. So I like this... We've interviewed him a few times on Triple J, this conservative writer called Theodore Del Rimple, who is a... Uh, He's like, he was a doctor and a psychiatrist who worked in ha at a housing estate areas in England and also in prisons in England. And so he's that by day. Then at night he went and so he writes all this real like scathing, but sort of funny, sort of like attacks on all, sort of not, not attack, he doesn't like name his patients, but sort of like describes why he thinks they're in the situations that they are in and what's led to it and stuff. So it like really messes with your head because, you know, I'm more liberal and stuff like that. But, but he's got all this authority and he's clearly not making it up. So it just like messes with my mind and all my preconceptions about, you know, the politics and issues. So I like stuff like that. So like, yeah, like Theodore Del Rimple, I guess. I used to like this writer, Jim Goad, when I was growing up and he's also does this whole twisting all your expectations and stuff. And at the moment I'm reading all these true crime books. I'm like I'm like just being blown away by all this stuff that everyone probably read in high school. Like, oh like I'm going around going, Oh, have you read in Cold Blood by Truman Capote? And everyone's like, Yeah, 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 yeah in year seven. Yeah, thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Is that, that it? Oh. Oh. One more question. Oh. I don't know. Oh, hang on. Oh, I don't know. Okay, well, yeah, I definitely have to wrap up, but I don't mind if you want to ask me the question later, that's fine. Whatever. Yeah, I've got nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just, like, stand there or whatever, and you can ask me your question. Cool. Anyway, thank you very much, and thank you to um, the Art Gallery of New South Wales for inviting me up. It's been fun. Thank you.